Beyond the Ring, a podcast that covers all things in the stock show industry from the informative to the insane, starring Ryan Rash. I am so sorry that I roasted marshmallows over your meltdown. And Dale Hummel. Do not plant the seeds. Now on with the show. Welcome to Beyond the Ring. This is Dale Hummel alongside co-star Ryan Rash. Hello, hello, hello. Ryan, what shall we talk about this week? Oh, we have so much to talk about. Dale, how you doing tonight? It is a good night. It's it's a little later than we, we normally record, but it works. See, I think that we should record all the podcasts at night from here on out. And let me tell you why. You want to know why? Let me tell you why. So I'm on the road and I have my microphone, my purple and pink microphone in a hotel ice bucket in my room. And I got to go eat, and I've had a few cocktails, and I'm ready to talk about whatever you would like to talk about. And you have no distractions, just you in the hotel room. Me and my ice bucket and my microphone. That's it. And I'm impressed you got everything hooked up. You didn't forget your microphone. Everything is good. I mean, I am the most ready. China! I think that's a great topic to talk about. We we didn't hit on it very hard last week. No, we did not talk about China! Ryan, are, are you aware that we're currently facing threats of a similar magnitude that we saw from the opposing powers just prior to World War II? Now, all I know is they sent us some seeds over here to plant, and all these idiots planted them because they wanted free stuff. And now we're going to have, like, crop devastation or, like, I don't know, something I'll like Little Shop of Horrors happen. I'm not sure which, but yeah. I'm- I'm not sure what that is, but I did look into it a little bit, and it's something they call brushing, I I believe. Now, they may be very invasive seeds. I I don't know. Brushing is when they send a package to get your address and a tracking so they can put up a review on Amazon or or wherever it may be. But it could also be invasive seeds. And irregardless, the fact that they're showing up at hundreds or thousands of of places across the U.S. 31 states in the U.S. 31 they could have sent invasive seeds, and we have some people out there that are less than intelligent actually planting these seeds. I'm telling you, I, did, you, you're probably not a movie person. Did you ever watch Little Shop of Horrors? I, if I did, I've forgotten it. Okay, so let me tell you what happens on Little Shop of Horrors. Like, this human plant, like, eats these people. These are what the China seeds This are. is what it is. No, yeah. that, that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. Well, beyond the seeds... And and I, I you know, I, I tend to do a little bit of research on China. And because uh, you love the <laughs> China. General Secretary Xi has publicly spoken out more than once that he'd like to dominate and control the Asia Pacific region and replace the U.S. as a global power in the world. In this current day and time, he's achieving this and not only achieving it, he's doing it without missiles. He's doing it without military power taking every unconventional route you can imagine and not missing anything. There's no question that we've, we've fallen a bit in world power. China's probably bumped up a bit. Let's hope that the opening of the window and exposing China a little more for what they are through the China virus brings things back into check. If we could form a Liberty Alliance with the UK, India, and Japan, those are the three most likely to jump on board the quickest. To battle back against China economically, this could all go away. It, it's simple. Via the purchase of products made in China by the U.S., we are basically responsible for a large portion of the dollars that props up the Chinese Communist Party. If we, as individuals, stop buying these products from China, this puts the brakes on the CCP. And if we align ourselves with other countries that will do the same, this completely goes away. And under this situation with General Chi, he is not planning to use troops or missiles to achieve his goal. He is simply on, on a fast track through, if you want to throw biowarfare, you can. But implanting and purchasing, I mean, they've been brilliant about it. And they've been doing it for so long. We talked about it last time, but it's, it's absolutely crazy. To the point that I had a family meeting about it, Ryan. and Which I did not get invited to. Or put on speakerphone. You will be invited to the next one. And your daughter, Tara, would say that that was rude. <laughs> she probably would. But we are, we are now, as a family, making a conscious effort to look at labels, not buy anything from China. And during this meeting, 
my oldest son was thrown under the bus by one of his younger siblings. He went out and bought a pair of Nike tennis shoes a couple of days ago. I don't th- I don't even know if Nikes are made in China. I don't know where they're made. I assume they are, but that's You're just ir- irrelevant. All about the I'm I'm all about Nike being the m- most anti-American company on the planet. That is what I'm about. Okay, look. All I got to tell you, I'm out. I am out. I do not support the Nike. First off, I only have two pairs of tennis shoes. And we know the gay doesn't wear them often. So anyway, they are Nikes, but they were like bought way before Man with the Fro kneeled on the ground and Nike said he was great. Secondly, the most important thing that has happened this week to all the Beyond the Ring listeners since Dale has been on his China nonsense. All of my shirts, my fashion, (laughs) I had to send him a picture. They are made in India, not China. So I can still keep wearing my expensive Robert Graham shirts with no problems. Dale thought he was going to have to like come torch Barbie Mansion. It's fine. We're all good. We're good. We're good. We're going to go through some more labels when you get home to make sure there's not some other Chinese made product. But we're, we're going to do our best to avoid those. Mm-hmm. Speaking of things that rock our country to the seam. Jerry Nadler. So Jerry Nadler, as as the chairman of the Justice Committee in the House, brings in Attorney General Barr to a hearing for questioning, basically. Ryan, brief us on what, what happened in this questioning. Well, first off, they did not let the Attorney General of the United States say anything. The Democrats didn't. They just, like, screamed and yelled and talked. And then when he tried to speak, they told him he was being rude, even though he was there to answer questions their questions but none of that seemed to matter like it was really really just beyond bizarre because when he would try to answer the questions that supposedly the democrats were throwing at him they're like this is my time you can't talk now sir quit being rude he's like i was trying to answer your question I, I cannot put into words what a joke this hearing was and the ignorance that, that I actually witnessed it. It was amazing. I just thought that it was really funny that Nadler literally is caught on video with his mask on his forehead, on his forehead, over his glasses, yet he is yelling at and reprimanding the Republicans for not having their mask on. I was like, dude, how stupid can you be? This this is the same person, Jerry Nadler, that goes on record, a reporter as he's getting into his car prior to the, the car accident. He goes on record denying that there were any violent protests or attacks on the federal building in Portland. I I, I, I just I'm I'm fully confused. Uh because he doesn't know where he is or uh, he, I mean literally he gets his footnotes from Nancy Pelosi and he just follows his marching order. I mean it, it just it's just black or white in terms of violence or not a violence in that situation around that courthouse it's been every single night and and it, it is violent fires there's fireworks there's lasers everything and he's he's saying there is no violence or no attacks on the federal building no. I I'm 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 beside myself well I mean, clearly, we're not listening to that man. But I I also have to bring up, how about your girl, Lori Lightfoot? She's doing a great job this week. I mean, like, oh, why man. can we not let her be the vice presidential nominee? I mean, she, she would make a great vice president nominee. I mean, Biden says he's picking a black woman. Why not Lori Lightfoot, a.k.a. Beetlejuice, for the win? I have not heard Beetlejuice come up in, in, in any of his. She's not even on the list, but why not? I don't know, but a, a shout out to, to Mayor Lightfoot in Chicago for ignoring the real reason that citizens in her city are being murdered. And violent crime rate is the highest it's ever been in Chicago's history. That That's impressive to achieve that. An 82-year-old man got carjacked in the middle of the day by people on, like, rental bikes. Yeah, rental bikes. And, and watching that video from a surveillance camera, these these thugs had no concern for anybody. Or it didn't even look like they're trying to get away with it. There was just do what they want to do. I hope I hope people see that video. I posted it on my personal page and on Facebook, and it's 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 unbelievable. It won't be on there for like five hours. They'll take it down. But yeah, that I mean, she's cool. 
So let's talk about the real vice presidential nominee of the Joe Biden of it all. Well, we don't know who the real one is oh, yet. We have yes, suspicion. We do. Because Senile Joe showed his hand and his notes to the press corps the other day. Drum roll, please. Do, do, do. Do, before the drum roll, do you think it was intentional that he showed his, his cards? Oh, I don't think so. I just think he's dumb. But anyway. I agree. Kamala Harris, ladies and gentlemen. That is who is going to be the president when Joe Biden is found incompetent if he beats Trump. This woman could not get any traction whatsoever in the presidential race whatsoever at all because she is just a ball of rage. I have never seen a woman get on national TV multiple times and just nothing came out of her mouth but venom. It, it was it was brutal. And, and every time she speaks, it's that way. So I, I don't know that it's official. I don't know if they're leaking that for another reason. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know what's going on. Well, if they're trying to throw people off the case of the real VP pick, she's literally probably the worst one he could pick. I mean, of the black women that he has decided that he's going to be, probably the worst one. And because the electors in California, where she's from, who she represents, they sent Joe Biden three names of black women that they would like to see as his vice presidential nominee. She won on it. They did not want her. No. No, that, that doesn't surprise me. And he's going to win California already. So he has two on the short list from Georgia. And today CNN put up a poll, which it's probably fake because I don't believe any of them, that says that Georgia's a toss up. So he might as well go with Stacey Abrams or that crazy ass Atlanta mayor. That would that would make more sense from an electoral college standpoint. Duh. I don't know why they're paying Kellyanne Conway all this money. They just need to hire me. <laughs> well, Camille Harris, th- there's no logical explanation for that. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, that's why I tend to think it was leaked for another reason. I mean, even people in her home state and people of her own race and her own gender do not like this woman. This is a terrible choice. I'm just going to wait to see what comes out. We are, we're told the first week of August. Next week. While we're talking about that, and we, we always talk about COVID-19 and, and so forth, I just wanted to, oh. to well, I'm not going to go down that path, but I wanted to bring up a statistical fact that since COVID hit, and this, this is perfectly logical, the polls indicate, and again, we, we don't believe all the numbers we see, but they have, if you if you keep it on a consistent basis, the poll numbers have continued to drop on whether or not our country's on the right path. Well, obviously, COVID has turned things That's the right, down. right track, wrong track number. Yes, that is what the Democrats are banking on. Exactly. We continue to fall. And I'm just trying to make it crystal clear for our listeners out there. I'm not saying COVID is not a bad thing and it is not real and it's, it's not out there. But do you realize the huge benefit that the Democratic Party is getting by continuing to focus on this, the more liberal media maybe blowing things out of proportion. I'm not saying it doesn't exist by any means. I'm no, just no, wanting no, no, to no. point out that there is a huge advantage going into this election to make COVID as bad as it possibly can be. And that concerns me because the rest of the world's watching. And right now it appears though we have more Rona in this country than the rest of the world put together. All right. So going to sum this up for you people again. When Trump was already doing things to keep the coronavirus away from this country by blocking the flights from the Wuhan, China of it all, and China, whatever, we were in the middle of an impeachment battle that the Democrats thought were going to be the thing that would keep him out of the presidency in 2020. And so when Trump did these preventive measures, they just laughed at him, mocked him, and said he was xenophobic, racist, etc. And then when the impeachment didn't happen, of course, and most of the country and all the polls said he should not be impeached, then they latched on to coronavirus, and here we are now. And it is a real thing, and 150,000 people supposedly died from it. I'm not convinced that number is accurate, by the way. I'm just going to be honest. 
not a conspiracy theorist, but I do see a lot of things and hear a lot of things about that, like, you know, the guy that was in a car accident actually got tagged from COVID-19. And then I do know of one family that swears, I don't know them personally, but other people do, that one of their family members had Rona in February, got over it, was never hospitalized, and then died because of cancer complications here in the last couple of weeks. And they are saying that the official cause of death is coronavirus. So I'm going to say there's some manipulation going on in the numbers. It does not matter. It's like Trump says, one person dying of it is too many. And it is a real thing. And it is serious. But the media is using this to scare the you-know-what out of everybody and try to change the election. Period. Paragraph the end. That is an excellent summary. Let's talk a little bit about that, some of the precautions that we're taking at some of the livestock shows. And Ohio Youth Livestock Expo is is gotten through their goats and their sheep, I believe. Ryan, you were just in Ohio the past couple of days. Well, I started a 20-day tour of the country. Now, my tour is not going as well as I had planned it for. It's, to, it's nice scenery, though, isn't it? Driving all over the country. Dale, I hate you. Next. Moving on. So, <laughs> I started in Arkansas, missed my plane, had to drive 11 hours, all this other stuff. I'm st- I am still in my own car now, people. I have caught a few plane flights, not nearly as many as I have wanted to or needed to, but I am in my own vehicle up here in the Midwest right now. But if you knew how bad of a driver I was, y'all would know this is not a good idea. And let let me explain that. About seven years ago, I did the actual math on my insurance, my tickets, and the number of incidents I had in an automobile. And I presented this evidence to my parents. And I explained to them that if they would just hire me a full-time driver, we would come out cheaper. Now, they wouldn't do it, but I was trying to be economical. <laughs> you had all the numbers presented to them. Right. I was trying to be economical, trying to, you know, do my part for the greater good. And they said, no, but that is a fact. And, and I, 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 I have heard you are a terrible driver. No one would say that if it wasn't true. But that was a fact. I could hire a full-time driver for less than what it would cost me otherwise. But I did judge a county fair in Ohio a few days ago. and. There were four health department people there on site. There wasn't probably a hundred sheep in the entire show. And we had showmanship. The health department officials at this county, I, I bet there wasn't a hundred, 150 people watching, maybe total. They made that county fair remove everyone from the show ring after each class and they had to sanitize the bleachers after each class. So you, everybody in that, that arena had to leave except for people coming in to clean it. Right. Wow. And I, and it sounds like the OYLE is doing similar, not, not quite to that extreme. They're disinfecting every couple hours, very, very much enforcing the mask rule. And, and part of what's going on in Ohio right now, and we're going to see it some of the other States as well. The health department's there. They're they're watching in O Y L E, the goat show and then the the lamb show. They made it very clear that if people were not following the guidelines, the cattle and pig show would not take place. At the county fair that I judged, they had the pig show first, and so what they did is they had weight divisions and age divisions and the breeding gilts and the and so. They would sanitize the stands after each division, make them come out, sanitize them after each division. And somebody reported them. And so the next day when I was judging shape, we had to do it after every single class. Or they said they would not allow the goats and the cattle to go on the next two days. And, and that's the situation we're in. And you know what? I, I don't want to wear a mask, especially when I'm judging. I don't want to be told what I have to do. But at this point, we're going to run into specific areas across the country and specific health departments that if we don't do this, the show doesn't take place. And it is my opinion that that takes precedent over our convenience or comfort. I don't like it, 
But if that allows us to continue to have shows, so be it. Well, I mean, that's what they said. You know, we're so sorry. I said, hey, if this is what it takes for the kids to show, we'll do whatever we got to do. But it, it was probably 150 people watching total. And of that 150, half of them weren't even sitting in the stands. They were standing at either end of the arena, you know, helping kids go in and out. But we got to do whatever we got to do to let the kids show. No, that, that's what it comes down to. And I'm going to call out something here that maybe is not popular. And, and again, I, I've been a part of it. And I don't want it to sound negative. But when we are in a situation where we don't have the health department there as livestock shows, we're pretty much back to normal. And I kind of like that feeling. I, I enjoy that feeling of normality. But in all reality, when we know that we're being watched, we can't do that because they're going to continue to cancel these shows. And that, in my opinion, is what we have to avoid it at all costs. It is even my opinion that we need to try to be smart about what we post on social media. Let's not give the public a spotlight shining on us, not doing maybe the things that some of us in the country want to happen. I'm not saying we need to agree with it. I'm not saying that sometime in the near future we can't avoid it, but right now, it's a very hot topic. It's something that the the spotlight's going to be shining on. So let's just be careful so we can preserve the shows that are yet to come. Well, I think the biggest problem is, is that most shows now are either webcast or they're streamed live on Facebook or, you know, there's pictures and stuff going up on them around the country because not every, I mean, like, a lot of these people are limiting the number of people that can come to the show. You have to have a wristband, et cetera. So you may not get to go and be in attendance. So somebody is Facebook living for you or they're web casting it, whatever. And so when they do that, that just creates evidence. So, you know, in the States that there's not a mandatory mask rule or any of that, I don't think there's any problem with it. But if there is a mask rule, like there have been, at some of these larger shows here lately and nobody's complying, that does not help things. And I'm not calling out anybody and I'm not going to, you know, give specifics. That doesn't help things because those places are going to have shows again because they're busy, they're booked and it's not helping things for, because there are idiots out there like, PETA that just thrive on this and that's all they do with their time is look for reasons for livestock shows and rodeos not to happen. Yeah, we, we simply can't give them those reasons and we just have to be smart about you it. You cannot load the gun for them. And it's not about just proving that we can do what we want. We, we just have to look at the larger picture. And, and again, I hope this doesn't last much longer. I think Ryan explained it well. Another example would be, and I I don't remember if it was in New York City or just the state of New York, but somebody posted a concert that was going on on social media. And again, I'm not sure if it's a governor or our wonderful mayor of New York. They are trying to track down the people that were in that video to prosecute them for not wearing a mask and not social distancing. Yet you've got them rioting in downtown New York without a mask, without social distancing on video, and nobody's chasing them down. So we we definitely are are nobody arrested them either. No, it's it's unbelievable. So I I am I am frustrated, but at the same time we probably better play the game to a certain level if we want to make sure to get kids in the show ring and whatever we have to do within reason of that we simply need to do. It is what it is and until the election in November, I don't think that there's any way around it. And then after that, like I've said before, I think no matter who wins, it's going to be different. But we'll see. How about our topic for the day? Oh, it's going to be my favorite topic ever. It's, it's, it's going to be good. I, I'm excited. And I'm going to make the most people unhappy, but that's okay. No, that, that always helps the ratings. I'm, I'm okay with that. for. Today. I know. <laughs> Stock terminology, do's and don'ts. We're going to talk about it inside and out. We're going to talk about the livestock judging arena, the reasons, formats, what we do and don't say in the set of oral reasons. And then we're going to just open it wide open to just judging terms in general, how the people 
sometimes misunderstand a specific term. We might even talk about some of these crazy terms that Ryan uses. I don't know what you're talking about. I do. I'll give you plenty of examples later. I am a lady. I don't use crazy terms. I get it. Well, let's let's jump into the the livestock judging contest terminology or formats. And, and Ryan and I, we, we haven't discussed a lot of that. We've talked about it a little bit, but not a lot. So livestock judging contest reasons, format, and terminology. Let's start with the format first. And, and I'll, I'll lead off here and just go way back in time. And, and I'm not even sure if Ryan's familiar with this or not. Do, 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 do. From a traditional format, we go all the way back. To, and, and as far as I can gather information, I, I remember some students coming in with this philosophy because of their parents. Dr. Hunsley at Purdue had a lot of success in the judging livestock judging contest arena, uh, dominated there for a while. And at that time when he was coaching at Purdue, they would not criticize a single animal. Nothing negative would come out of their mouth. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. And have you ever heard of set that way, Ryan? No. No, I've only heard a few, and it was in my early days of coaching. And what it was is some students that came into, into junior college that had a high school coach or a parent that was on Dr. Hunsley's team, and that's simply how they were, they were taught. And there was a lot of success with it at one time, but obviously we've evolved and, and we still have some very structured whoa, 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 whoa. How do you explain how first goes over second, second goes over third, third is over, if nobody has any faults? Yeah, it was just, I mean, think about your conditional format. They just like wiped this them. one was the heaviest muscled, so it's one? They would still compare that this one's heavier muscled than the other one, but not a negative term, not a actual criticism. Lord, Say you play some, that must have been boring. What, oh, one, two, three, four. You can talk the, the things that one is better than two, but you're not directly criticizing two. Nor three, nor four, nor one. I, I mean, I had one of the most brilliant livestock judging team coaches ever, Dr. Chris Gags, and he would always tell us, you never know who is listening to that set of reasons. So when you walk in there, you always have to think that the person that supplied that class of stock is the one listening to those reasons. So when you did get critical or even on, especially on the last pair, just always have in the back of your mind, this guy could have raised that fourth place animal. And I get that part of it. And, you know, when I'm judging actual shows every day, I try to find something positive about every single animal in the ring and start with that because I don't want to be completely negative. And so I get that part of it, but I, I don't understand how you don't criticize anything in a set of reasons. That sounds like participation trophies to me. At one time, it was very popular. And I think you're right. Part of it was a philosophy you, you were probably given to the breeders and the people supplying the classes. I get it. And at that time, a lot of sh more shows and sales were going on. So when you're judging that show and there's a sale immediately afterwards, I think there was just that trend. Let's, let's be a little more kind is my assumption. Again, I'm, I'm just speculating here and I'd love to visit with some people that obviously know how that all began and why. But we have evolved in, in more of a, when I talk about a traditional reasons format, and I haven't discussed this with Ryan, but it's let's just continue to use the one, two, three, four placing. We come out with an opening statement about one, why one's better than two, something positive that maybe two has in terms of an advantage over one, then a criticism of two. Then we go into the same in the middle and the final pair. To and me, yes, to me, it's, it's difficult and it's hard to imagine until you sit through a hundred plus sets. And it's the same thing over and over it's and over again. Boring. So again, for those of you on livestock teams and the coaches out there, remember, this is just Ryan and I's opinion. And if you're given to us, this is definitely going to score you some points. But there are more traditionally minded reasons takers out there. So you still go whatever direction you need to go. But we're going to give you our opinion on what we like to hear and where, where we're at in terms of, of trying to shake that up. Dale, you are just as traditional as a turkey at Christmas dinner. <laughs> no, not. And you still even do think that the way that it's been going for years and years and years is boring. That should be a wake up call to people. That, that should be. You're, you're right. I struggled with it. You were a coach. I struggled with it as a coach. And we broke out of that, that traditional format. And, and again, if you have extremely talented, intelligent 
students that you're working with, they can really break out of that format and go a lot of directions. But if they're not able to evaluate accurately, it's going to hang them. So I, I am, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge supporter of, of let's, let's talk about the positive and the negative of each animal, do it in a manner that, that comes across a little more unique, and a little different because by gosh, after we've listened to that many sets, you need to get our attention. I think that we are at a point in livestock, competitive livestock judging that we've got to evolve and, and they're doing a little bit, but that standard format is just so, so boring. I, and I think we are doing a little bit, but the key is there a little bit where we're reaching a little bit of time and it seems like almost the majority of the good teams are doing the same change. Does that make sense? Right. Nobody has broke. Nobody. There has not. And this is nothing against any coaches or any teams or anything. Not one team, not one coach has come out with something completely unique and individual to them yet, in my honest opinion. And that is what I would like to encourage and say. And identifies them as. This is what we do in the reason room, and this is us. And by God, we're proud of it, and we're excited, and we want to be unique and have a twist that nobody else does. And if they're really good evaluators and accurate, it works. It will work, I should say. No question. If they come in and, and don't describe them accurately, they're, they're, they're in trouble. But they're in trouble when they don't do that anyway. Oh, yeah, they're in trouble when they do that anyway. But like, And, and some of these kids are very talented. Come in and whether the easiest pair is the middle pair or the bottom pair to keep it simple is the first thing they'll say. And then they give me seven sentences about how it was simple. If it's simple, it should take five words tops period. I'm with you on that one. Absolutely. Do you remember when we had to have very, and we still do to a certain degree. And early on when I was coached and early on in my coaching, we were very, very, very species specific on terms. This was a problem for me. <laughs> There was a lot of things that were a problem for me when I was judging, but I just didn't like that. I don't understand it. Like, and even back then, like these were sheep terms, these were hog terms, these were kettle terms, and you did not go like they gave you a list in the class. There might be a couple terms that cross the line, but in general, you don't. And in the those terms cross the line. And in the yeah, uh -huh, next. <laughs> there might have been a couple others, but and I was like, this doesn't work. It doesn't make sense. And I don't know. I guess I've just I always did what worked for me, and that didn't work for me. And so the first half of my judging career, we had a I had a different coach, and I don't know if Skaggs listens to podcast or not, or Chris Bowman does either, but. I would literally give reasons in practice one way and then just say exactly what I wanted to in a room. And I know I am not encouraging that people do not think that that is me encouraging it, but that is literally what I would do because I knew what it would take to appease people and make them happy. And then I just went in there and did what I exactly what I wanted to. Again, do not do as I say. Ryan, did I tell you that there's some things we should leave out? Well, then you shouldn't have me on your podcast. <laughs> no, I, I understand where you're at. And, and, you know, I think to try to justify why the coaches were species specific in terms and to a certain degree, some of that is still taking place, but they, they would always talk about, well, we want you to sound like a cattle kid or a sheep kid or make them think you grew up in that because you're only using sheep terms or cattle terms. And there was probably a time and place for it. I just don't think it's now. Do you know how many times people would say, oh, my God, your biggest problem is you're not going to sound like you grew up on a slatted floor in a hog barn. Okay. <laughs> you didn't, did you? I made it work. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm sure there's still some of that going on, and, and, and we're not trying to tell anybody how to coach. We're just giving our transparent opinion that I am very much a believer in, in what Ryan is is also stating here. We do need to evolve. I think we need to simply simply come in with confidence, personable, well articulated, describe the positive and the negative of each. Being a little bit different, just like Ryan says, nobody's really reaching out there. As long as you're good, as long as you're accurate, that being different is going to score points, I think, with more people than not. I'm telling you, 
there are more people that I talk to that listen to the reasons that want to hear something new. And I mean, it, the age range is from the young to people that have been doing this for a long, long time. Everybody wants to hear something new and fresh. And so I think it's time. I mean, if you're not accurate and you don't place the class right, you're not going to score anyway. But if you are that person or that team or that coach that can get that team to place them right, describe them right, and then you have something that is unique to you as a team, I'd say you slay. And, and Ryan, and not taking away from your evaluation abilities, because I think your accuracy when you were going through the judging contest was probably as good as anybody's, but I am convinced the fact that you came out different in so many ways definitely got their attention, and it put the spotlight on you that they listened to everything you said. So if you said something wrong, they're going to nail you. But if you were dead on, I'm assuming it helped you more than you can imagine. Oh, I mean, there was no doubt that because I was different in a lot of different ways, I mean... People knew who I was, knew my background. And then when I started doing so well, then it was even more pressure. But yeah, that was there. But you still had to be accurate. You still had to be right. But like, if I could get close, then we were okay. Because <laughs> I could make up a lot of ground in the reason room because I just, I was, I was different. I did things different. I had a different, and even though I said things differently, you couldn't. I mean, obviously, I didn't say the things that I say now in the arena, but I still said things differently. For instance, at Dixie National, there was a top pair. And the worst thing about the one that had to win is today, I would say she had a head only a mother could love. That day in the reasons room, I said she was rank headed. I was the only one that called her out for being rank headed. So I got a 50 and nobody else did. So. <laughs> I wasn't afraid to not push the envelope back then, but I just had a different style than everybody else. And speaking of, of, of pushing the envelope and, and maybe not following that exact traditional format, how do we change that format? How do we come into it? Maybe if we, we address it just a little more like you would talking for animals in a, in, a, in a show. One thing that I will applaud most of the coaches and teams for especially in the market classes now, it's not that every placing has to be tied to a carcass turn. God, that wore me out. Like <laughs> that practical side of it really got to you. Well, like sometimes it's just obvious. Like you don't have to go there. And so I don't think there, and yes, some that still needs to be in there and it's still important and I get it, but it's not like every placing one over two at the end carcass turn. Two over three, carcass term. Three over four, carcass term. I mean, that that is what it was for years and years and years. That's how you would end. You would have to tie a carcass term to it. And so I think we broke out of that just a little bit. And when it when the placing is obvious in a pair, you don't have to do that. Some of these classes in these contests, they're really, really good. And I think if you just go in there and describe that animal, as well as you can, you don't have to exactly give detailed reasons on why that one wins over the one that's second. Just describe those cattle as much as you can. And then, but I'm not going back to what you were saying earlier about none of them have flaws. Give them faults. But even the first one has a fault. That is one thing that wears me out. When they come in there and they see me and they try to like do something crazy and use one of my terms, like I was going to throw glitter on this one or whatever, da, da, da. But that one's not good enough for that. And that one, and then they just talk all these great things and never fault it. Every animal in the world has a fault. Bring that out, even if it's a great one, because if you can nail the flaw in the great one, you're going to get points. That's it. That's easy. Not, I mean, it just, just needs to be done and, and don't be afraid. And just like Ryan's talking about there, don't be afraid just to come in and talk the good and the bad about each of those animals. And guess what? If we're describing the good and the bad rather than the old school, trying to convince them that your placing is right. And that and that's what it goes back to. In my mind, we used to have a 
coaching philosophy the way before my time, we're going to convince that official that, by gosh, this is what I did and I'm going to convince you I'm right. That ain't happening. I promise you. It will not happen. But if we come in there and describe the good and the bad of each of those, not necessarily say this one has to be here, this one has to be there. Obviously, we have a placing on them. But if we can talk the good and the bad, we're, we're avoiding maybe where we hit that bad pair switch or something like that and trying to convince them that, hey, it needs to be this way. No, we just see differences in them and, and maybe prioritize wrong. Paint the picture that I have in my mind and you'll score. Exactly. What about getting that reasons listener to like you? Huge. I've gone over this before yeah. and I, I still tell this story. I mean, we talked about this a lot in terms of when we had our deal on livestock judging. Or we had our podcast just about livestock judging. Uh, it's it's huge because it's a make it or break it moment. And I'll, I cannot reiterate this story enough. Young man walks in. I, I'm not looking up. Look down at the contestant number. I said, sir, are you 21? And he says, man, I wish I was. And he was a junior college kid. And so that kid had me at hello. And I mean, he won my high set that day because not only did he get me right then, but he was very good at what he did. And I mean, we're lifelong friends now, but like you've got to either make them like you, make them want to listen to you, have something that they're looking for when you walk in, or you got to nail it in the first five seconds or you're toast, period, paragraph, the end. You just you just don't listen. You don't focus on what they're saying. And if you don't like them, guess what you're listening for? Everything they say wrong. It lies. And, and it's easy to pull out when they come in with something that hits you wrong. Okay, on a, a time restraint here, let's move on to show ring terminology. And we've had a lot of requests <laughs> from different, list, different listeners about certain terms and what do these terms mean. And we're going to keep it a little traditional to start with, and then we'll kind of open up to some of Ryan's terms. So we don't want to confuse the issue. I know, Ryan, you said we'd had somebody contact you about the difference between fill and fat. I don't know, just somebody said that they thought that would be a really good topic or a really good episode. And not just that, but just several different things where they think that the line gets blurred and things get confused. And I agree with that. And like they're Phil versus fat. Just because that one's porky, that doesn't mean that's right. Yeah, they're full, but they also tighten in their spine and waddle when they walk and you know, they're over conditioned and stuff like that. But I mean, I just think there's a lot of times that people, again, they think, oh, we got to keep them full. We got to keep them full. We got to keep them full. And so they get them to the point that it's so much that it inhibits the way that they move or they practice that even at home, not just at a show. And they're over conditioned because they're feeding so hard to get that fill. Yep. And the whole thing is, like, when you get them fatter, they do look thicker. But if you get a knowledgeable person out there, they're going to know that's white muscle and not red muscle. And I think sometimes, even as simple, and this sounds too simplistic, but sometimes people associate Phil with being fat when they're not. But Ryan's talking about feeding that hard to open up that rumen and open up that body. By doing that, we are going to get them a little fat and yeah, it does make them thicker, but if if we have somebody evaluating correctly, we we can tell the differences. And I caught a little bit of heat on a Angus show up in Wisconsin that I went up on some of the heifers that I thought were maybe a little questionable on body condition. And I and I Ryan, I know that you would never probably do this, but I put my hand on the rib just to to see if they're that inch of fat. And you know what? I'm not so sure some of them weren't. Well, like if you want to handle heifers, that's fine. I mean, I any couple in the ring, just just out of curiosity. I'm not going to judge you. I mean, everybody should do whatever the hell makes them comfortable when they are the judge. It doesn't bother me. And honestly, I think you were actually doing that just to gauge how fat they were. It really didn't have anything to do with your placings. But, I mean, we got people judging market animals without feeling them at all. So well, who the hell am I to judge? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Okay. What about uh, swoop to the belly? As long as we're talking about fill and fat and things like that. You, What's you, wrong with sappy bellies? No, I'm, I'm asking you, explain the swoop to the belly. <laughs> I don't know. It's a slang term. And people get so, I don't know. They just get angry or volatile over slang terms and stuff like that. And I don't, I mean, 
I don't think I've ever used swoop to the belly. Maybe I have, but I know I've used sappy bellied because I like to make fun of the swoop to the belly term. <laughs> <laughs> so I do use sappy bellied, but swoop to the belly from in the slang version is a slang way of describing roundness of lower one third of the rib. And what, how are, are do you, do you think there's some roundness in that lower one third or do we believe it to be rumen fill, fat, and digestive fill? Probably everything, but it's funny to talk about. <laughs> it is. It absolutely is. Well, that's um, like squishy pastern. Okay. Everybody's like, oh, they got the big squishy feet. All right. Um, soft pasterns are actually a negative thing, not a cool thing. But I mean, you know what? It sounds good. So now remember, we have to have a little flex to the pasterns. We don't want those straight. I don't think you want them squishy. Probably not squishy. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Squishy. There, there's another term. I like the word squishy now. I, I'm, I'm kind of out. <laughs> This is one that I had a difficult time when I was coaching students because my vision of feminine maybe didn't always match everyone else's. So I'm going to throw it out there for you, Ryan. What does feminine mean? Let's use cattle as an example. Explain to me feminine. What what do you think when somebody uses that term? Or I can only describe what I think in my own mind. Uh, I think feminine is one, it doesn't matter if it's cattle or any species, unless like they're good headed, they're refined, they're thin in their throat latch, they're attractive in their neck. I'm not saying they have to be giraffe neck, but they're attractive in the way that that neck is laid on to that spine and skeleton and shoulder. But most importantly, if you're talking about feminine in the front one third, that head has to be correct. If you're going through the whole body and the whole anatomy, it comes down to joints. And a lot of people don't realize this, or at least when I think of it, you know, if they are bigger jointed or coarser jointed, because, you know, we want them as fat legged as we can get them these days. I don't think coarse joints remind me of feminism because I can't say femininity either or feminism. So, uh, <laughs> Don't go with feminine just like cankles don't on a woman. Just doesn't work. Doesn't work. So you're describing feminine similar to how you describe a feminine person. Right. Yeah. If she looks like Miss America, she's going to be feminine. If she looks like a tranny, probably not so much. Now, I could take this another direction with your, your longer, what you call more correct head, which is not a descriptive term. I didn't say longer. I said correct headed. What correct is correct headed? Give me a correct head. Okay. A correct. Oh, Lord, you're going to get me on. This. <laughs> right. Are we long? Are we short, blocky, Angus headed? Where are you at? No. First off, no Roman noses, no screwed up jaw lines. I mean, like, and I don't have to have them as stout in their jaw as some, but they've got to have some. No overbite, underbites. I had a heifer back in my day. She was a Simmental, she had this big old fugly head. And this one guy said, she has a head as broad as Texas. That was not a compliment. That was not feminine. No. Everybody out there can look at some livestock head on no matter what species and go, you know, that one looks good. That one does not. But if there is a, I guess the best thing in terms of breeding stock and females if there is something that distracts you, it's not feminine. Fair enough. Now, you could take the argument that feminine would relate to a little bit narrow, hard-doing cattle. Yada, yada, yada. You could, oh, you could talk about feminine by its its true definition. That's the ability to raise young year in and year out, and that has to do maybe with joints and fleshing ability. But that that in general, now there are some people out there that would take it that way. I understand the majority are going to take it exactly as you described it. And I'm, I'm not arguing that fact, but rather bringing out there are two different definitions. So I caution students when they use that, they better qualify and describe maybe in a little detail which direction they're going with it. Because if we just toss that term out, they toss it to me and it's it's a real hard doing one. She might be good headed, but if she is, is hard bodied and, and a little bit on the narrow side, 
I can't, I can't completely swallow that that's a maternal feminine animal. I also did not say that the head decided the whole class, but now. <laughs> okay. Let's go on to, oh, we talked about this one once before, I believe. The, the longer muscle. You tell me what that means, if you would, please. We already went over this on we another did, podcast. But we're on the term, so you got to hit it. I will disagree, I promise. Oh, my God. Here we go again. You do not think there is anything in the universe as a long, a long muscle. You don't. I don't know why. This is kind of like, I don't, I don't even. You, like, there is difference in muscle. I, I don't care. You can even look at bodybuilders. The biology, the biology says with the, the myofiber diameter is going to change, but the muscle fiber numbers are all the same. I'm going to send you some flashcards and some slick shirt stairs, and you're going to be able to tell real quick that some, there is differences in shape. Yeah, there's, 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 there's muscle fibers with less diameter and muscle fibers with larger diameter. And, and there are cattle that are and sheep and goats and pigs that they are pinned wider from behind. So they have just as much muscle because they are pinned wider and it doesn't have to be round and stubby. I am so. I won this argument last no, time. This does not dictate muscle fiber diameter at all. It has I won this argument last nothing. time. It was all over Facebook. I won. You lost. No, you just you, can't you, give it up. There, there's. I mean, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard you say. You lost last time. You're going to lose <laughs> okay. again. There is a long muscle pattern. There are lighter muscle cattle. No, there are heavier muscle. long muscle pattern not there are either. larger framed animals dale, that would have a no, longer muscle no 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 dale there are cattle there are sheep there are pigs there whatever we are going to bring a muscle oh biologist on to solve this argument you're wrong i have one and i have one in mind by the way no because i know i want to i want to honest third party i, I would bring i would bring dr skaggs in for this one no yeah i would he I'm would just say I was wrong because he don't like me no more because I didn't lose all his hair. Oh. What about what about Matt Clay's? He'd be an objective. No, that's your buddy too. No, sir. I want a complete <laughs> and no. Uh, we're gonna bring somebody from a foreign country you don't know. All right, fair enough. Let's let's move on. We'll we'll jump out of that one. Um, what about just using a term like attractive fronted? Is that that's boring? Is it descriptive though? No, oh, there are attractive. I mean, there are attractive fronted ones. But isn't the beauty in the eye of the beholder? Somebody might think attractive is a stouter head, and others might think it's more of that correct feminine. Head. I I think that most of us would agree. Again, I think that's why a lot of times, whether it's in the actual ring or in a raisins room, people get in trouble because they throw a term out there and then they don't back it up. They say this one's attractive fronted, but they don't explain what attractive is about it. Exactly. Nope. I, I agree. I had somebody bring up to me stoutness. They're tired of people calling wool, woolly legged lambs that are narrow stout just because they've got a bunch of wool on their legs. Then don't call them stout. Call them shaggy. Ex that would be more descriptive. But stout does mean different things to different people. Some are talking about bones. Some are talking about muscle and, and how big That's hip they when are. I judge if I say they're stout, I explain why they're stout. If I say they're stout featured, that means they're bone and foot. Perfect. And I think that that is how it needs to be done. No question. Um, round rib. What the hell is wrong with round rib now? Nothing. I'm not saying this. I am not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I would like, I can or, or you can. And we need to, some people, I, I've had that question a lot. What do you mean when you say round ribbed? They're Go confused. People invented the round rib of it all. So I don't even want to hear this shit. On the, on the flattest rib species there is. Exactly. By yeah. By nature, no, there is not. No, round rib has nothing to do with depth of body or depth of side or depth of flank or forerib. It is literally when you stand in on top or behind that one, how round that one's cage and rib is. And we kind of like it because it's unique and it's a little bit of a freak show. I actually think I put more emphasis on roundness of rib than I do depth of side because depth of side and body depth and flank, all that in a market animal, that's all going to be cut off and by the wayside and I mean it doesn't matter. But roundness of rib is something that is like definitely more pronounced, cooler, definitely trendier than anything else right now. 
it does fit the circus format well. And I like it. I'm not trying to say I don't like it because I, I do like some of the unique things. And I'll tell you what, when they put their hands on that market lamb or that market goat and that ribs really, really up there and out on the, on the upper portion of the rib, by nature, they just assume that's, that's a more muscular animal. May not be, but it certainly gives you that illusion. But that roundness of rib trim goes to these people getting them more fat than full. It's very true. It's all part of it. Think about it. Think about our hog show ring and those round rib barrows. Those are, those are fat barrows that have really been manipulated. Mm-hmm. You're right. More times than not. And by nature, ribs just aren't round. They may have a no. little curvature to them, but not much. No, they're not. We're, we're trying to defy Mother Nature there, and we do that with a lot of things. And remember, I, I think it's good on goats, but the rest of the world needs to stay practical. Uh, of course. Only the goat people can have the cool stuff. What about, do we talk about composition in our market animals anymore? You don't have to break that down a little further. <laughs> you see, to me, it's name. just, to me, it's just automatic when I, when I use the word. Is a term from the 1920s that I don't know? We are I talking about the balance between muscle and finish. I talk about proportion in almost every class I judge. Proportion yep. of? Of everything. Bone to foot, muscle to finish. I talk about that in almost every class. I, I mean, literally, I say proportion, probably proportionally correct, dynamic in terms of proportions, all those things more than any other time I went. Maybe that is my word for composition. But I think it is, and, and, and to a certain degree. But, yeah, I mean, I want it all to fit, and I want it all to blend correctly. So I believe that the traditional definition of composition would be just it sounds like something you write to me it would be lean to fat or lean to muscle ratio we want them relatively lean and muscular and that's a correct composition we're not fat and light muscles yeah. where, I, I, where I it came from writing a novel here i'm just giving you a little bit of maybe a little bit of history on that one just i i knew maybe that was missing there mm-hmm. um quality and yield grade do we ever talk about quality grade in the steer show or yield grade I don't, uh, I don't personally, because again, this is just like last week when I told you, when people ask me, what's the next trend going to be? What's all this? Whatever. doesn't matter what species it is. I am not Madam Cleo. I do not have a crystal ball. Therefore, I cannot tell you what is under the hide of that animal. All I can tell you is if I think that there is enough finish on that animal that if their genetics allow they should be able to roll into whatever quality or yield grade that is acceptable. <laughs> Even though we don't define what that acceptable level is. I think we all know what the acceptable level is. Well, I think it's, I think it's different in different parts, but we, we obviously are trying for low choice, I would assume. With that, though, obviously there's, there is a correlation. I know we can't read inside them, but in, in the correlation of subcutaneous fat over the rib relative to marbling, it does exist, maybe not as high as we need to. And obviously, yield grade, we can make some assumptions on how big that ribeye is and, and how much fat's there. We can we can determine some of those things. But I guess I just wanted to bring out the point that if we go back very far in time or you find some of those cattle judges that, that have been doing this for a very, very long time, you're going to hear those kind of things. And I think when our young showmen hear about a quality grade or a yield grade in the steer in the show ring, they're confused at this point. I don't know. I mean, I think that most of the kids that show at some point have some livestock judging teaching, whether it's in school or in 4-H or whatever. And so I think they know something about it. But I really do think that a lot of it is, again, and I know you don't like to hear this, this is a show. It's not a car. <laughs> if you want to have a car contest, go have one. Go have one. Just hang those things up and, and judge them. Exactly. I'm I'm okay with that. I under I understand the, the differences there and I can I can accept accept those. As we, we talk about some of these different things, Ryan and, and I got to listen to you here a couple of weeks ago at Ohio, and it's interesting to me if, if we go to a livestock show and we bring a person that's recently come off a collegiate judging team and maybe hasn't judged a lot of shows yet, more times than not, they're just a little more formal, they're probably a little bit faster on the microphone on occasion, just a little nervous. And they're probably using terminology that they used in those contests, giving those terms to experienced breeders and others that have listened to reasons and are, are very much 
in tune with livestock terminology. But when we throw those same terms to those 4-H exhibitors and the general public, do you think sometimes they're scratching their head trying to figure out what they're talking about? Well, this is another thing that was not rehearsed and you're really not going to want to hear and neither is any other college judging team coach that's out there. And I can say that I never was one. Judging four in a class in a livestock judging contest does not prepare you to judge a show in a ring at all. Period, paragraph, the end. Done. Over. It just doesn't. It is not the same. Now come back around to the terms that would be used. It's the same thing. Talking for animals on why you placed them in a livestock judging contest has nothing to do with how you place, even if it's just four in a ring. It is not the same principle. It is not the same concept. It's not the same audience, first of all. I like that right there. That's what I, I would like you to to bring out just a bit. It's more. not. And so when you are at a live show, you have people that have never been to a show that are there watching a friend, a relative, or maybe at some of these larger events, they just stumbled in from the carnival or the, you know, concert back when we had those and are just their ringside. Then you have people that are on the level of people that listen to reasons and livestock judging team coaches in terms of education. You have breeders that have been doing it for 50 plus years. You have every level of savvy, experience, knowledge, etc. right there at the ringside. You have to find a way to grab and make all of them understand. And you're not going to do that with Dan Set of Reasons. Those specific terms don't don't work. And as we're talking about that, I want to throw it out there. And I, I got to listen to Ryan. And you know what? He's using terminology that nobody else is using. But the crazy part of it is that person that just stumbled in, that person that might be a young 4-H member, and the experienced livestock enthusiast, these crazy-ass terms that he uses, and I'm going to use an example, they understand. When he talks about Big Booty Judy, they know that hog has a big old whomping butt on it. Just that simple. They all get it. If we talk about more center width and dimension to the ham and carries it down to a deeper stifle, what are they doing? Scratching their head, probably. They're like, ham, where's the steak? <laughs> so there's a lot to that. And when we talk about making this educational and giving reasons and explaining what's going on for those 4-H exhibitors and parents and ringside, those that can maybe get in tune and learn from that, not only when when we, we break out of the box like what Ryan does, and, and I, I've witnessed it a few times with Ryan, it's also entertaining. And all of a sudden, we're going to a show and you're, it's not only educational and all the, the traditional benefits, but you're entertained on top of it. That's pretty popular, right? I, I'm not trying to build you up here because I, you know, it pains me on occasion, but, but you do, you're, you're the best there is at it. In your chair, you have. <laughs> no, you are good. I just, it's that simple. But let's, let's go on to a few of your, your do you want to give away into your terminology today? Oh yeah. I mean, everybody hears it, but here's the thing. We spend way too much time, effort, energy and money at this and only one person is going to win at the end of the day only one person is going to win and i'm telling you in the last since rona i started judging shows after rona i am going to tell you i'm not going to say who and i'm not going to say where i have been at a show where the person that won was not happy because I didn't use the one they wanted to win. So you can't even make the person that wins happy sometimes anymore. But we spend way too much time, effort, money, and energy at this for us not to have a good time. And that's why I try to be entertaining. And it doesn't matter if it is the guy that's been breeding them for 50 years or the six-year-old that hasn't got to show yet or somebody that just came to watch their friend. I think everybody should have a good time. And that's why I try to use terms that are different and unique that everybody can understand what I'm saying and makes you smile or laugh. I think it's it's gone over so well and I enjoy it personally. And maybe I'm biased on that one because I've always enjoyed listening to you and, and the way you put the words together. And, and it, it's amazing to me. It, uh, it's, it's, it's truly impressive. And when you think about those kids and, and prior to these day jackpot shows where we show off the trailer and in and out. And even in that, 
But if we come in the day before and, and set up pins and get pinned and check in the next morning, then finally show that next afternoon, that exhibitor may have one animal there. They may be in that ring for, let, let's say they don't make that final cut and you dismiss them. Maybe they're in that ring for five or 10 minutes and somebody's out there and just talks maybe a little bit on the formal side and they're in and out. The, the kid doesn't even understand what they're talking about. Maybe isn't that excited or enthused because there wasn't that, that passionate, enthusiastic level. And I'm not saying everybody can be like you, Ryan, by any means, but we need to engage. We need to be uplifting. We need to have that passion come out. So those kids get excited about being there and make them feel important. And I think everybody is going to do it in their own way. And it's more difficult for some of us than others to do that. But if we, anything we can do for that short period of time, those exhibitors are in the ring, considering everything that Ryan just talked about, the time, the money, the energy, not to mention the time just sitting around at that show waiting to get in there for that short period of time and the drive home and the drive there, all of those factors combined, we've got to give them a good experience. No, you're absolutely right. And not, not everybody can say the stuff I do and be me. And you shouldn't because you need to be yourself. Everybody needs to be their self. And there is only one of me. Thank God bless America because Lord. No, we did. We did see a Facebook post that some girl in Iowa wanted one of you. Right. Just yeah. wanted their own Ryan. And you you are trying to like take plugs out of my ear and sell them, which is not funny. But anyway. If, if I could get enough money for them, we would find a way. Yes, I'm sure you would. But everybody's got to be themselves. And like there have been people like people ask me all the time. Does it bother you when somebody uses your terms? I don't copyright them. I come up with them. Everybody knows I come up with them. But no, it doesn't bother me because I'm just being real honest. And this is not to be derogatory. When some six foot two straight guy in a blue solid shirt says one's built like a Kardashian, it doesn't have the same effect as when the gay does it. And that's just all there is to that. I mean, that's just it. It doesn't so, work does not it, work. It just doesn't have the same effect. So, no, I, I mean, I don't get angry or I don't get mad. I mean, again, I don't copyright these things, but that's why I come up with new ones all the time. But everybody's got to be them. But more importantly than being them, you've got to find a way to connect with those kids in the ring. And it, it doesn't have to be that you have to say crazy stuff on the mic or anything like that. Just find a way to make every single one of those kids feel like they are wanted and appreciated for coming there and spending their day and their money and exhibiting their animal to you. And however you can do that best as an individual, that's Not the direction right. we go. Absolutely. And I think your terminology really resonates with a lot of those kids. They, they just love listening to it. Well, I try. And I so look forward to the next show that, that I get to, to hear you describe some livestock. Actually, Ryan's got a show, I believe, tomorrow. Um, I don't know that I'm going to be able to make it over there to it, but I would enjoy it. For the next little bit. But, you know, uh, I, you know you're know, you a busy man, Dale. you got cats and hogs and goats and children and wives and multiple. All, all, all kinds of things going on. I know. You, you're busy. Very busy. <laughs> well, uh, I've, I've enjoyed today, Ryan. I hope you have. And I, I think. We maybe shed some light and maybe we were, were, hopefully we don't offend anybody, but very transparent on where we think the livestock judging contest format and terminology is. And hopefully we've opened some eyes up to let's describe those livestock in a manner that hopefully everybody can understand. And we don't have to be quite maybe as formal. We can loosen up just a little bit. But again, everybody has their own personality and, and go with it. And we appreciate those of you that are out there traveling the countryside, judging these shows and taking that time away from home. And, and just like Ryan's on a 20 day tour right now, just the fact that you're committed to the level to do those things, I appreciate that you're doing it. And you don't have to do it like Ryan. You don't have to do it like myself or anybody else. Do it the way that best fits you and, and continue to because there's a lot of benefits coming from everything involved and everything that that is surrounding the stock show arena. What Dale said, I'm going to agree with him for the first time ever, maybe. Other than China. I knew China was coming. I knew it. We, we're, we're maybe going to talk a little more about China next week. 
But until then, please be safe. We'll visit with you next week. See y'all next week. 